In early 2007, I was freshly 18 and newly married, living in Fort Polk, Louisiana, while my husband was training at Fort Benning. I was born and raised in Alaska, so living in the continental United States was a vastly new experience for me. My husband had a weekend off, though he was not allowed to leave the base, so we bought a Greyhound bus ticket for me to visit him and meet the soldiers he became friends with. I had never been on a Greyhound bus before, but I was excited to drive through the south and see new places and have my own little adventure. Sure, plenty of creeps bothered me on the bus and at the stations, but I still had interesting conversations, met new people, and generally enjoyed the experience. Regardless of the time, each station we stopped at was open and offered food, outlets for charging, and bathrooms. So when we arrived in Columbus, Georgia at about 2 a.m., I expected the station to be open. It wasn't. Everyone else who ended their journey there had a ride waiting for them, and suddenly, I was completely alone outside a locked building in the middle of downtown Columbus, full dark and terrified. I didn't know what to do and my phone was nearly dead from the last long leg of travel. I thought about walking to a gas station, but I had no idea which direction to go, and I couldn't see any nearby lit buildings. I truly expected the station to be open, thinking I would stay there for a little bit while my phone charged, and I had something to eat, and could have access to a phone book so I could call a cab. All I had was an old sign hanging on the side of the building with incomplete phone numbers for taxi companies. The numbers had faded, been scraped off, and defaced. There was only one complete phone number, and it was handwritten in Sharpie at the top of the list. Better than nothing, right? Wrong. I called the number, and a guy answered, casual and sleepy, asking who I was. I apologized, explaining I was trying to call a cab, when the guy perked up immediately and said, Oh, yeah, that's me. I'm on my way. My phone died 10 minutes after I made the call, and it was another 15 minutes before the guy showed up in a traditional looking yellow taxi. I noticed the cab wasn't marked, no logo, numbers, rates, anything, but it had that taxi light thing on the top and in my young naive mind seemed totally legit. He waved me over, I got in and asked him to take me to Fort Benning, finally feeling some relief. The doors auto locked and I'll never forget the first thing he said to me. He was silent until we got on the main road and said, Did you really think it was a good idea to call a number written in Sharpie? I froze. In retrospect, no, it wasn't the best idea I've ever had, but I had so few options and didn't want to be stranded in a huge foreign city in the middle of the night. I don't know what else I could have done. After a minute, I tried to laugh it off and hope he didn't notice I was shaking. I reached for my phone before remembering it was dead and realized that if something happened to me, no one would know if I even made it to Georgia. Staring at me in the rearview mirror, the driver told me what was going to happen. There's no use in getting to Benning this early. The post hotel isn't even open. Drive around with me for a while, hang out, and I won't even charge you. I told him no thanks, that I really needed to get to Fort Benning right away. Nah he said, and that was that. We drove to a worn-down apartment complex where he told me he was picking up a regular to keep me company. I didn't reply. What could I even say? I wasn't raised religious, but I was praying to God for some kind of miracle. Out came a woman who looked like a cliché woman of the night. Tube top, miniskirt, smudged mascara, and an unlit cigarette hanging from her lips. Short but ratty bleached hair, pockmarked face, cheap purse. I had no idea who or what she truly was, but she got in the front passenger seat and lit her cigarette. She turned to look at me. Don't worry. He's cool. We're cool. Uh-huh. That definitely helped. I had never considered jumping from a moving vehicle before, but even if I wanted to, the back doors were child safety locked and I couldn't open them. Trust me, I tried. I was trapped like a caged animal, just waiting to die. I felt so stupid, so foolish, sitting in the backseat of the cab, no idea what to do, and no idea what was going to happen to me. I kept trying to rationalize it, downplaying the situation in my mind. I was too afraid and frozen to actually do anything anyway. As we were driving around, the girl was telling me about the driver, 
how he was ex-military and had just started this cab business, what a down-to-earth fun guy he was, and how lucky I was to be picked up by him, how I was cute and young and everything was cool, cool, cool. Her words were a bit slurred and I knew she was either drunk or on something. I didn't really want to know. We pulled up outside a small blue house some time later, about an hour before the break of dawn, and the driver told the girl to keep an eye on me while he went inside. I'm in full-blown panic mode, the suspense of it all making it so much worse, so the girl offered me a cigarette to calm my nerves. I wasn't a smoker, but I said yes. She got out of the cab and opened my door, stumbling a bit before sitting on the curb and lighting another cigarette. She lit mine as I sat next to her and I started thinking about whether or not I could outrun her with my heavy backpack and how long the driver would be inside for. Without me asking, the girl told me the driver was inside showering in preparation. I asked what he would be showering and preparing for, but she kept repeating how he was cool, how much fun we were going to have and how cute I was. Then she said, Ranger cab, because he was like a ranger or something. Or maybe that was his dad. He's a good looking guy. Military muscles. God finally answered my prayer when the girl slumped over and passed out in the grass. I saw the track marks on her arms. And apparently the driver was inside taking a shower and wasn't about to come back in the next few moments. I grabbed my backpack and ran. I don't remember exactly what happened after I started running. I know I took off as fast as my feet would carry me and that I didn't dare stop to catch my breath. One minute I was sprinting for my life, lungs on fire, and then I was trudging along with tears in my eyes as I walked through the Fort Benning Gate with my military spouse ID, asking how to get to the base hotel. Honestly, I wish I knew how I got there. I was in deep survival mode and didn't stop processing any of it until I made it to my room. I don't know if someone gave me a ride, if I followed a map or what, I've never blocked a memory out like that before or ever again. I told my husband everything when I finally saw him. He didn't believe me. I probably wouldn't believe me either. His lack of trust made me think no one would take me seriously, so I never went to the police. I still had the number I dialed saved in my call history. I knew the girl called it the Ranger Cab. What I didn't have was the confidence or support to report it. Sometimes I think back to that day and wonder what would have happened if the girl didn't let me out of the cab, if she hadn't passed out on the ground, if the driver never stopped for a shower. It's one mystery I don't need the answer to. So this was long before catfishing became a term we used though the act itself has been around as long as social media has. This was back during my freshman year of college, and it was during the MySpace era. In college, I made friends with someone in my honors colloquium class, Leslie, and she in turn introduced me to many of her other friends, who then became my friends. They'd all known each other for years, but were very welcoming to me, and I felt much like part of the group. That being said, I didn't really know them that well when this happened, what they did seemed, well, not like them. But then I realized I didn't exactly know what was like them. A member of the group, Catherine, was going away to school in Boston, and so the night before we all decided to have a going away party of sorts. We were going to visit another friend, Tamara, who was going to school in Philadelphia, which was about an hour away, and then we were going to just have fun in the city. Our designated meeting place to drive down there was Dunkin' Donuts. When I got there, Leslie was there with our friends Samantha and Anthony, and Leslie looked angry. She was sitting there with her arms crossed, kind of staring at nothing but with an angry look on her face. As for Samantha and Anthony, they kept looking at the door, and they seemed both nervous and shifty. I could tell they were on edge. I sat down at the table of awkwardness, since we had to wait on Catherine and a couple of more friends, and things got awkward when no one was talking. Finally, I was just like... What's the deal with you three? Leslie replied. You should ask them. Gesturing to Anthony and Samantha. They suddenly looked guilty, but before they could answer, the door opened again, and they both went from looking guilty to anxious and mildly scared. I looked to the door and saw just a normal guy, pretty nondescript. When he walked in, he just kind of glanced around the room, 
like he was looking for someone. Anthony and Samantha wouldn't say anything. Leslie just kept huffing and shaking her head and all three kept looking over at this guy as he sat down. As soon as Catherine and the others got there, it was like we couldn't get out of there fast enough. Catherine, our friends Evan and Julie and I were very confused. It was on the way to Philadelphia that we learned the truth. It was Leslie who told us. Apparently Anthony and Samantha had created a fake MySpace account and they'd been catfishing this guy, Calvin. We didn't know the term catfishing yet, but that's what it was. They had created a fake account using a picture of an actress or singer or something. I can't remember, only her face was obscured. Apparently this had been going on for a couple of weeks and the conversations had gotten serious, like Calvin seemed to really like this fake girl they had created. I didn't know why they did this and when I asked them, they didn't really have a reason. Mostly they were just bored. It turned out that they had told him to meet them at Dunkin' Donuts at the time we were there. I think that once he showed up, Anthony and Samantha realized that this wasn't just a game, that Calvin was a real person with real feelings and I do think they felt badly about what they had done but it was too late, they couldn't take it back. There was no reason they had chosen Calvin, he was just some random guy they had picked. I guess Leslie had found out about it a couple of days prior and told them to end it, and that's why she was so angry at them, because they had told her what had happened, that Calvin was supposed to be there. After that, I never really saw Anthony and Samantha in the same way. These weren't really people I wanted to be friends with, especially when I saw the messages and saw how much they had gotten Calvin to like him. I thought this would be the end of it. I was wrong. About a week later, everyone came to my house for pizza and just to hang out, and Samantha and Anthony told us that they had gotten messages from Calvin. I didn't think much of it because I already knew he had been messaging their fake account, wanting to know why she had stood him up and he seemed upset, especially when this fake girl stopped replying. But no, that wasn't what Samantha and Anthony meant. He hadn't messaged the fake account, he had messaged their accounts. I remember them telling me that. My sharp intake of breath, the way my heart rate increased, that unnerved me. The messages were more of the same, but also Calvin made it clear he knew what they had done and he seemed even angrier. Anthony in particular got a very long furious message from Calvin. I don't want to say that I thought they deserved it, but honestly, they had done a terrible thing and there were some consequences. I figured it would die down in a couple of days, but it didn't. A few days after Calvin had messaged Anthony and Samantha, he started messaging the rest of us who had been in Dunkin' Donuts that night. Now this really scared me. Keep in mind that I was already dealing with other stalker situations, so I was understandably on edge and this guy had found me. I didn't know much about computers, but I thought he must have traced Anthony and Samantha's IP address or something since they used their own computers for their account. But when it came to the rest of us, we didn't understand. How had he found us? My theory is that once he found Anthony and Samantha, he looked through their friends and recognized us from our pictures, but I don't know for sure. All of his messages came on MySpace, so at least he wasn't texting us and stuff, but still, his messages were very angry. He kept saying things like, how could you do this to me? And you made a fool of me, how dare you? I thought about replying, but Evan had done that already, telling Calvin that we weren't responsible and he didn't believe him. Honestly, Evan totally sold Anthony and Samantha out, but we figured that Calvin already knew they were the ringleaders. He just didn't know that they were the sole perpetrators, instead thinking we all had a hand in it. I figured there was no point to defend myself since Calvin didn't believe Evan when he had tried. This went on for a couple of weeks, and it seemed like Calvin was getting increasingly angry the more we ignored him, because that's what he said we were doing. Finally, I had had enough. I replied and told him again that we weren't responsible, corroborating Evan's story. I didn't actually put all the blame on Anthony and Samantha, but I told Calvin that it was just a couple of people in the group. Then I apologized, though I think that only made him angrier. He didn't believe anything we said, so I blocked him. We all did. But he just kept making new accounts. In two weeks, he probably made three different profiles, in addition to the one he had had at the beginning. When I finally defended myself, Calvin messaged me back and said, You made me into a fool, an idiot, 
and one day you'll know how that feels. I think you will. Maybe it was because of everything else that had happened with this guy, but that sounded like a threat, like he was going to personally make sure I knew how we had made him feel. We were lucky. As far as I know, Calvin never did anything beyond messaging us aggressively. It could have been a lot worse, like it was my other stalker and me. Eventually, Calvin stopped messaging us, and then he deleted his account. I felt bad for the guy, and Samantha and Anthony had been wrong. But what Calvin was doing to us was wrong too, the harassment. Eventually, he stopped though after a couple of months, and I never saw him again. I slowly drifted apart from the group. First Anthony and Samantha for obvious reasons, then Catherine, then Julie, Evan, and Leslie. I wasn't too broken up for the first two because they weren't the kind of people I really wanted to be friends with. Not only had they done a terrible thing, they had brought this Calvin into our lives. Like opening a door and inviting somebody in. I was visiting family overseas in a wonderful positive country. Their flag is a huge plus and was waiting for a tram with my mom on the first day I was there. I was extremely jet lagged and tired having landed at 9am local time after barely sleeping on the flight and train ride over. I wasn't at my best mental functioning level but it's best to power through and try to acclimate to the new time zone as soon as possible. After a few minutes of me swaying in place with exhaustion, a man late 20s, early 30s, strode purposefully up to me and asked, Are you a man or a woman? Well, that's nice. But due to my fatigue state, my brain farted out. Personal interaction, beep bop, yay. I stupidly entertained him and responded that I was a woman. Overjoyed, the man babbled at me in a mix of English and French throughout the wait and then got on the tram with us while I nodded and looked anywhere but at him. For the first time in my existence on this earth, my mother had nothing to say or anything nasty to interject, so I was unsupported and uncomfortable. In a single breath, this guy told me his name, Omar, and said he was from Morocco, asked for my phone number, and said he was losing himself in my green eyes. Ever helpful and caring, my mom finally jumps in and proceeds to give him my number. I stare at her in horror while he dials it in and then turns on me, angrily saying it doesn't work. Well, you didn't use the country code, it's an American number. In any case, just wait and call it in five days when I'm 4,000 miles away from you. He says he's going to whatever place a few stops away, so I drag my once again silent and useless mom off the tram at the next stop. Not before I got a big hug and kiss on every available surface of my face, along with a, I will see you soon. Great, I can't wait. My mom offers me nothing in the way of apology or any sort of response at all, so I forget about it and the rest of the visit goes uneventfully. Once I'm back in the US, I find that he somehow found my Facebook. My number is not in any way linked with that I could find, but maybe I missed something. I don't accept his request, but that doesn't stop him from messaging me multiple times daily with what I assume are attempts at poetry, all revolving around my eyes interspersed between these declarations suggesting his likely eventual harvest of my eyeballs, he adds to multiple group chats that are all in Arabic. I can neither speak nor read Arabic. Eventually, I'm in like 15 different Arabic group chats and I have no idea what's going on, as Google Translate was no more understandable than the chats themselves. I hadn't blocked him yet because, like a car crash, I couldn't look away. Finally, I message him back to say that he seems nice but I'd like to keep my eyeballs in my face and I'm sure he'll find a nice lovely girl to harvest parts from in the future. Before I block him, I get a last plea. My love is your eyes. Please let me gaze upon him again and hold them forever. Super romantic. Definitely not grade A Buffalo Bill in the making but not enough to make me feel any less secure in my decision to block him and change my number. I visited overseas a number of times since then, and have thankfully not seen him. So I come from a place that has had, and still has to this day, some serious problems with violence towards women 
and kidnapping of young women is sadly a thing that happens very often. Although I lived all my life in a decent area, some of the other areas weren't so decent, so I kind of learned how to avoid problems. So it's been a while since I moved to another country where I had been feeling safe for the past two or three years, and my family decided that it was finally time to pay me a visit at my new home. The differences between environments were so great that they were all perplexed and amazed about doing things that would be otherwise considered normal to many, like going out at late hours of the night. During their stay, I suggested we all go to see the city center, and we did. It was such a lovely thing. The weather was nice. We had dinner at a good restaurant and took some pictures, but they began to get tired, so we began to head home. It wasn't even 11 p.m., but it had been a long day of going around. I was talking to my parents as I led the group back when I noticed a couple of men coming on the opposite direction with their cell phones up as if they were taking a video. I ignored it and kept moving, thinking they were just tourists. I got chills when I noticed that the guys, only one block away from where I first saw them, were standing a couple of meters from us. These guys had gone back on their steps somehow and were now very near, not five minutes after I saw them. Furthermore, they were looking at me intently and even following me with their eyes. My first reaction was to ignore them, pretend that I didn't see them as to not alert my family because it so happens to be that some of my family are quite dramatic and would just blow things out of proportion. So I carried on, and these idiots did too, even trying to walk as closely as possible to make eye contact with me. I began to use my father to hide from their view. He's tall, chubby, and has always had this appearance of being a frightening person, but he's pretty chill and less provoked. For a time, this worked and the guys kept their distance, but when we arrived to the metro, it got even creepier. One of the guys found his way to sneak around to be one person behind my dad on the electric stairs and tried to walk past my dad, even attempting to keep making eye contact. Then I noticed that his hands never left his face, covering his mouth for no reason. The other guy was far behind, but I managed to keep myself out of view, and luckily whoever that was in front of the guy pushed him backwards. I don't know how, but we managed to lose them between the crowd, but not before I'd get a last glance at them saying something to each other, still keeping their cameras out and pointing at me with their fingers. A few years ago, my roommates and I lived on the third floor on the back side of an apartment building. She was in the process of moving out though, so it was mostly just my dog, George Washington, and I. I knew just about every neighbor in my building, and from what I knew, they were super chill. In order to understand this story, I need to explain the way my apartment was set up. In order to get to the door to enter our apartment, you have to pass by my window, which was a very long window in my bedroom. I had never had any issues until about 2 a.m. on a Saturday, well, technically Sunday. I heard footsteps on the walkway outside my window and saw a shadow pass it. I usually am a groggy person when I first wake up, but ever since it had been just me, I was more aware of my surroundings, so it jolted me awake. I had a nightstick under my bed, so I grabbed it and debated what to do next for the next 30 seconds. I opened up my bedroom door quietly right in front of our main entrance and started to notice the handle jiggle ever so slightly. Clearly at this point I knew I could either A. crap my pants, B. get attacked, or C. scare the person off. Choice A seemed the most likely for my personality type, but choice C it was. I turned on the outside light, kicked the outside door as loud as I could, and screamed a string of words that would make a sailor blush. I heard footsteps turn and quickly walk the other way. I called my stepdad who was thankfully living close by. He came by to check on me and wanted me to stay with them but I said I would be fine and off he went. The next morning I got up to get ready for church, not really thinking of the night before. I returned home shortly after and was texting on my phone as I reached to get my keys and put them in the lock on my front door. I couldn't find the keyhole though so I looked up and noticed that my entire lock had been bashed in. It hadn't really set in what had happened yet, so I opened the door and looked in. A lot of my stuff was gone. Televisions, computers, jewelry. Luckily they left my doggo there and unharmed, 
The irony is, I got him to be my best friend and a guard dog. He fulfills one of those roles, but I'll let you figure out which. My brain caught up to my surroundings, so I grabbed George and ran outside to call the police. They came out, guns drawn as they cleared my apartment. It felt surreal to talk with forensics in your own residence. They never found out who did it, and in the end, it worked out okay. A lot of the jewelry they stole was from an ex that I had intentions of pawning anyway, and renter's insurance covered that, so I got some sweet new technology upgrades. However, I'm still very unsettled internally about that night and day, particularly about that night. I replay it and often wonder what would have happened had I not woken up or if the person hadn't been so easily turned away. It also is very unsettling to know that they were watching me, waiting for me to leave for church so they could break in. Ever since that day, I keep my head on the swivel and pay extremely close attention to my surroundings, particularly when I get home. Something like a week ago, I came back from school a little bit late so I could take my dog for a walk right after my return. It was around 5pm and it was starting to get dark. The walk itself was pretty normal. The same path, the same people, everything seemed usual. But when I was getting close to my apartment building, two random women approached me. One of them had really short hair and looked like someone in their 30s. The second one was harder to describe. She had long hair and a specific type of look, like some overgrown, not really pretty girl, and she was the one who started the encounter by saying, Can I pet your dog? That question didn't really surprise me. My dog looks pretty cute and a lot of people were asking me the same thing, but my dog often barks at them for no reason. He never hurt anyone, but he could scare someone. I replied that petting him is not a great idea because my dog often barks at people, making it pretty apparent. But she approached him anyways. My dog was surprisingly friendly and didn't bark at all. Then she asked, What is your name? I was busy calming down my dog because he was jumping all over the place, so I didn't hear the question correctly. I asked, His name or mine? To which she replied, Nah, yours. I was surprised because no one asked a question like that during any of my walks with the dog, but I told her my true name. She reached out her hand but didn't say her own name. I shook her hand, being a little bit confused. Then she asked, How old are you? I was starting to be a little afraid. It sounded like a typical child kidnapping situation that you can watch in commercials. But I, being a complete idiot, told her my true age. Then she came a little closer to me and asked, Can I take your leash? I, being completely frightened at this point, was starting to say no when her sister, that's how she called her, said, Oh, come on, you have your own dog and your own leash. Besides, Paul is going home, he doesn't have time for this. The long-haired girl, disheveled, asked me, Paul, you're not going home, right? And gave me a weird look. I said the truth about being late and in a hurry, so I'm going home right now, but she came even closer and asked with a voice of a child who wants a toy from a shop, Can I have the leash? And started to reach for it. I moved my hand back and quietly said, No. I was more frightened at this point. Her sister started to pull her arm and going away, saying, No, you'll have it next time. Come on. The girl in short hair reached out her hand again and I shook it, being completely disoriented. I started to head home when she shouted, See ya, Paul. I went back home really fast and started telling my mom what happened. She said that there are two options. The first one is that the girl could have been autistic or something and the second one actually kind of scared me. My mom started telling me about multiple child kidnappings and that I could have potentially have ended up being one of them. When I take my dog for a walk, I look around all the time and hold my leash really hard, as it was some sort of weapon of sorts. She could have wanted to take it out of my hands so it wouldn't block her from kidnapping me. I couldn't be sure. Now I'm afraid to go out when it's dark outside, even though I loved it before. The 
this happened about four years ago. I had just graduated from high school and was a month and a half into summer break. Needing money for college, I began working full-time for the school district I had just graduated from. Due to a music festival I wanted to attend as well as monetary concerns, I did not go with my family to North Carolina, which was fine by me. What 18-year-old doesn't want a house to themselves for a week? Furthermore, my parents' house is out in the country, so I had little to no fear about my neighbors complaining about parties or being bothered in any way whatsoever. But I was wrong. I often take the back roads home from my friend's house, but on that night I decided I wanted some McDonald's, so I took the main drag and came home on a different route. This way takes you past a mechanic's shop not a mile away from our cul-de-sac. It was between midnight and 1am and as I passed the mechanic shop I noticed a car's lights turning on. Or should I say, for this car had only one headlight working. I remember thinking it was strange that this car all of a sudden turned its lights on as I was passing and began to become even more concerned when it pulled out behind me. But I tend to be paranoid by nature. Nothing serious, but I always question if the person behind me is following me and whether they mean me harm, so I brushed this off as an unfortunate coincidence. But as I neared my street and the car was still tailing me, I started to become freaked out. I looked at my gas tank and my heart sunk as I saw I was on E. Either I pull on my street and go home, or I risk driving around some and seeing if this dude follows. Yet that option held the risk of my car running out of gas and leaving me stranded on the road, and I figured I'd rather take my chances on my own soil than on the side of some dark and lonely country back road. So I turned onto my street only to have my heart sink when the one headlamped car makes the turn right behind me. At this point, I know I'm screwed. With nothing left to do, I begin pulling up my driveway. It's a hill about a hundred yards long. To my utter horror, they begin to follow me up. Looking back, I should have called the cops, but there is no love lost between law enforcement and myself, and at the time, I was too caught up to even consider calling them. If my family would have been home, this never would have happened. I could have called my dad, and he could have grabbed his gun, but he along with the rest of my family were gone, twelve hours away at the beach. So when they began to drive up my driveway after me, I stopped and put my car in reverse. They responded to my reversing as well, yet they stopped at the bottom, effectively blocking my driveway. At this point, I pulled forward again, only to have the same jig and dance happen. They followed, I reversed, they reversed and sat at the end, blocking my escape. I quickly pulled up and turned my car around to come at them head on. By this time, they were halfway up my driveway, the furthest they had come up. Looking back, I was terrified, alone, and angry. Who did this person think they were? With my brights on and shining right into their face, I opened my car door and got out. I pulled out my pocket knife and grasped it in my left hand while I grabbed my hammer in my right. I used to keep one in between my seat and door. In some weird, desperate mindset, I made a split-second decision to grab the hammer from the head with the handle sticking out. My hope was that it would be mistaken as a gun. I began yelling and pointing my hammer slash gun at the car, screaming at them to get out of here and what do you want? All the while, I held my hammer as a gun and prayed that they would fall for it. Whether they did or not, I can't say. Part of me believes they thought it was a gun due to my brights being behind me, making the whole front side a shadow, yet they could have just not wanted to fight. Perhaps they thought it was a girl or was timid and wouldn't react so aggressively and violently. Who knows, but it worked. They slowly backed off my driveway and crept down around the cul-de-sac. As they were leaving my street, I ran after them, hiding behind my neighbor's houses, and at every driveway, the car would slow down to a near stop, as if scoping out the houses. Thankfully, they didn't pull into my driveway and they turned off my street altogether. After I was safely in my house, I ate my McDonald's by the front window with all the lights turned off, waiting to see if they would come creeping back. Thankfully, they didn't, but that night I locked every door in the house, which I always did anyways, and slept with a hammer, machete, and baseball bat next to me and my pocket knife under the pillow. Complete overkill, I know, but I was terrified. Now I know where my dad keeps his guns, so if it ever happens again, 
I'll be better prepared. I live in a crappy part of a city in Ontario, Canada with my parents. I woke up at 10 in the morning, for I had a busy night of cleaning. I did the usual routine of turning on my laptop, checking my emails, Facebook, etc. And then I got a knock on the door. Now we are looking for a new house because our landlord wanted us out immediately and she is one of those unprofessional ones. When I looked at the window, there was this woman who looks like she could be related to the landlord. I woke up my dad, who I'll call Bob, and he answered the door. This woman was actually a homeless person, but something about her seemed a bit off. She had her pants down, but she was wearing leotards and she smelled terrible, like a dead animal was left in a garbage full of expired food for a couple of months. She has a teardrop tattoo below her eye. Now, for those who don't know what that means... A teardrop tattoo is a symbol for the wearer who has committed some form of murder. She pulled her pants up and starts rambling on about some mumbo-jumbo crap, including that meth is medicine. One of the mumbo-jumbo stuck with me. She said that she was a guardian angel. She kept going on and on about how she's just a spirit trapped in a body. She also said that she was dead three times. She asked for a place to stay, but we said no. Good choice of words in my opinion because she was giving me major red flags, like she was giving a vibe that she was unpredictable. We gave her coffee, cigarettes, and warmth, but she gave me major red flags. We finally asked her to leave nicely and she took 45 minutes to get ready. Kept asking for a ride or money for a taxi and we couldn't do that. I know that seems insensitive, but we gotta do what we gotta do. So she finally left, but she didn't wear her boots left them right on the neighbor's lawn, leaving us to enjoy the rest of our day. Sophomore year of my undergrad career, I took a class that was quite challenging and 90% PH due to students because my dean suggested it in place of a typical econ class. I thought it would be cool to be challenged by such a class, which I was, but I also had the unfortunate encounter with a PhD student who actively tries to ask girls to paint their faces. It was a very small evening class, maybe ten of us in a small room. I'm very shy and everyone was older than me, so I didn't talk to anyone. Very soon after the semester started, I get a Facebook friend request. It was one of the PhD students. I thought it would be useful to have a contact in such a difficult class, he had different motives for adding me, though. Note, we have not spoken or even greeted each other in real life. His first message to me read, Quick, how do you feel about face paint? I asked what he means, and he sends me some Google image photos of Day of the Dead face paint as well as some juggalo stuff. He then asks me if he can paint my face, and then sends a question mark when I don't reply for 20 minutes. I said, I think I'll pass. And he goes, why, with a frowny face, and follows with, still no luck in the face paint department, a week later. So at this point, I am actively ignoring someone that I have to be in a small room with two times a week. Maybe that sounds harsh or like I'm being presumptuous, besides just trying to protect myself as a young woman. That's because at the same time, an app called Yik Yak was very popular for college students, it's basically a totally anonymous forum where people at respective campuses can say what they want. While browsing, I find a thread of someone complaining about a dude who is persistently asking to paint their face. A few other people in the comments say they've encountered the same person. Naturally, I join in the conversation. This leads me to find this dude is posting on the app himself. He very tactlessly uses the same account to both ask girls to paint their face and also impersonates girls and pretends to praise the great work he did on their face. The weirdest thing I saw him post was a photo of some naive undergrad in the dorms with her face painted and bragging about how they had made out after he did it. This guy does not try to be subtle, and joins those incoming class Facebook groups asking freshmen if he can paint their face. At this point in time, he was infamous, and my friend told me about the posts in those groups, 
I should also mention he was in a relationship throughout all of this according to Facebook. I would totally like to believe this is some hobby of his that he genuinely wants to have an outlet for, but his behavior on Yik Yak suggests it does something more for him. He also seems to target young freshman girls specifically and, in my opinion, thinks it comes off innocent when it in fact does not. I had a class in the same building later in my college career, in which he has an office, and I would hope with all my might that we would not meet again, knowing he was a huge weirdo who probably resented me. Something just sparked this memory, and I felt I should share it while it's fresh. I had some other drama down with my gaming group that left things bad, and I wanted to avoid them online and start over. This is a story all of its own that's long and convoluted, so after making all new accounts, I decided to search my old handle and see if anything came up. Nothing really interesting or even about me till the bottom of the first search page. It was a missed connection type posting on some forum. Do you know how to find old gaming handle? I think she lives in the city from things she said while streaming on Twitch. She has cats, 16 years old. Wrong, I was 19. Super creepy that I thought I was underage and was still trying to dig up contact info on me. It listed some other info about what sort of things I was into. Talked about my accent. Asked if I didn't live in the city it was posted to, if someone knew what city I was actually from and what my real name was. Real cake topper is that they had a screenshot of me during one of my few streams with the post. This really freaked me out as I've had several stalkers of varying degrees over the years. The post was a month old thankfully with zero replies but also I had not streamed on Twitch in about 5 months so this person was thinking about me for 4 months before posting this plea for information. After freaking out for a bit about it I contacted the site, linked the post, told them it was me and that this was creepy and I didn't want people crowdsourcing information on me. Luckily whoever ran the site was understanding and after only asking for minimal proof it was me a picture with handwritten sign with that day's date, they took the post down and banned the person's account. Side note, I doubt it was my old gaming friends as they knew the exact area I was actually from. Very strange. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, or let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my discord to interact with me and other listeners directly and if you want to support me even more grab early access to all future narrations for just one dollar a month on patreon and maybe even pick up some let's read merch on spreadshirt links in the bio thanks so much friends and i'll see you again soon